last week. You heard that we lost a warrior last month. His name was Ranger Gary Horton and uh, very influential in our family's life. And in fact, our pastor, my son, indicated that he was so important in his life that he, Ranger Gary Horton, was a main reason why my son decided to join the Army and when we were at war. And then... go through the agony of training to get invited and to make it into ranger school and then make it all the way to the end to get his tab. Now, before I get started, um, we've been gone all week. We've been at our house in Arizona and you have us to thank for bringing back this nice warm heat. For you all. So as we get into the hundreds this next week, you can say, in your heart, you can say, thank you, Bruce and Billy, and you're welcome. Ranger Horton was a one of a kind. And I know that. Um, most of you outside my family don't know this man. But I have never met anyone like him. And so when he died last month and got promoted, I wanted to take the opportunity to pay a tribute to him and to his influence, not only on me, but on my family. For some reason, he cared about our crazy family. And are you, are you not able to hear me? Maybe the microphone's in the wrong place. Somebody dress me. Somebody help me. Is that better? Okay. If you know me, you know I need all the help I can get. So thank you, son. Ranger Gary Horton was a soldier through and through. He had that warrior ethos. He had that warrior mentality. He was always on as a soldier. And he, when he got out of the Army, he traded his being a soldier in the Army to being a soldier in God's Army, but with still all the zeal and all the passion and all the conviction. And he taught me from Ephesians chapter 6 from a soldier's perspective. And I would like to share it with you this morning. I have done so uh, before, years ago. And uh, if you were here and you remember every word that I spoke, then forgive me. This will be just a refresher course. But this is a piece of scripture that Paul wrote in his letter to the Ephesians that is incredibly applicable to us today. So if you will, open up to uh, Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 10. And I'll share with you <clears throat> what Ranger Horton told me after I asked for the Lord's blessing. Pray with me. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this opportunity to be back home and to be in church how awesome it is to worship together in the house of the Lord. And now, Father, I pray that as we open your word, you will teach us about yourself. Father, I pray that my words 
would come from you, Holy Spirit, not my own. Move me aside, open the ears and eyes of our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. As Paul writes this letter to the church in Ephesians, in Ephesus, he's in prison. He is under constant guard um, by Roman soldiers. And he has lots of opportunity to observe how these soldiers conduct themselves and their uniform and their pieces of weaponry. And so, as he observes this, he begins to make a comparison with the Christian soldier and our spiritual tools and our spiritual weapons and our spiritual armor, just like the Roman legions had, he adapted the spiritual part of this. And in the last chapter of the letter to Ephesians, he's already given them instructions on how to live together, husbands and wives, the relationship between servants and masters, children and parents. And now he, he begins his, winds up his conclusion by saying, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. See, we can't do this. We can't do this in our own strength. It has to be in His strength. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Ephesus was in the center of the worship of Artemis, or Diana. And the Christian church that was founded there faced a lot of opposition. Death threats. They were arrested. They were threatened with all kinds of things. And so it was important for Paul to fortify these Ephesian believers to face all of the evil schemes that were arrayed against them by the enemy. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The attacks come through men, but who is behind the attacks? That's what Paul is saying here. We have to arm ourselves from all of the attacks in the spiritual realm that usually use people as their tools, just as God uses us as his tools. So does the enemy. Therefore, verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. This always puzzled me a little bit because I didn't understand until Gary Horton. He explained to me that the Roman soldiers, the Roman legions, were the greatest fighting force in the world at that time. The equipment, the weapons, and the way they fought allowed them to conquer most and hold most of the known world. He said, when they 
formed in their battle formations, they were ready. They stood ready. Now this command to stand firm is different. It's a different word than Greek, stay te. It's one thing to be equipped for battle. But as the enemy is making their charge, you can have every piece of equipment, every weapon, but it's useless if you turn and run. The command to stand firm was what every Roman soldier passed up and down the line to each other as the enemy was making their charge. Stand firm, stand firm, stand firm. Don't run. So Paul tells the Ephesians, take up the whole army of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. This evil day that Paul talks about here might be understood as being the final evil day, the final battle in which Christ returns and defeats forever the enemy. However, it can also be interpreted as our evil day. You know, there's evil out there always, all the time, it comes and goes, it wafts and wanes. And we each have had our evil days. I'm going to tell you about one a little bit later on that we went through, that Ranger Horton was instrumental in helping us through. In that evil day, and having done all to stand, stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Now, Paul is going to lay this out roughly as a Roman soldier would prepare for battle, the pieces that he would put on. And the very first one was the belt. The belt went all the way around, and from it hung tools, weapons, strips of leather down over the, the lower body to protect it, but it was that belt of truth that was central. It is essential that every Christian embrace and hold on to and wear their belt of truth. If a Christian lies, how is he ever going to stand up to the father of lies when that father of lies brings temptation? Truth is the bedrock. You have to embrace the truth. And the next one is the breastplate of righteousness. For the Roman soldier, the breastplate of righteousness covered the chest and went all the way around and covered the back. It was a complete piece. And <clears throat> this is meant to be something that you, you uh, Christ's righteousness, yes, for sure. But this is our own sense of righteousness. What is right and what is wrong? Paul is saying here, you have that. Put it on. Uh, let me give you an example. Men are not men, and women are not women. Not only is that not true, it's not right. All love is good love. No, it's not. 
That's not right. And it's not true. These are things that we face in this day and age. One of the lies and the liar needs to be confronted with truth and righteousness. Our understanding of what is right based on what's here and what is not here. Now, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given to the gospel of peace. You see, the Roman soldiers wore hard shoes, and they had hobnails, and that was to give them traction. Because if you've got on a pair of flip-flops, when the enemy is approaching and the attack comes, you're not going to be able to stand your ground. You're going to have to have something that you can dig in, gain traction, especially when the wave hits you. Stand firm. The gospel of peace is the foundation. Paul's saying, that's what your feet should be shod with. And I'll tell you, I traveled around with Gary Horton. He was around here a lot through the years. There was not one person that he ever ran across. I don't care if it was a waitress. I don't care if it was the dental assistant. I don't care if it was someone who opened the door and said hello. He was always ready to share the peace of the gospel message. He was driven to do it with everybody that he ran across. And it was something that my father-in-law also did. Everybody that he ran across, he was ready to give the message of the gospel of peace. You've got to hear it, and I've got to tell you. And, you know, when I sit down in an airplane, as I did last night to come home, I don't always want to engage with somebody who's sitting right next to me, the stranger right next to me, and try and steer the conversation towards the gospel of peace. Uh, and, so there's a lot for me to learn about how I can do that because it's part of my armor. Now, verse 15. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And here's the key. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer, and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all of the saints. The last few years of uh, Gary Horton's life, he was unable to come out here. He just was physically too, uh, too weak, too infirm. He used to come out here, oh, two or three times a year. There was something about our family that fed him, that nourished him. and I'm not sure what it was, but he liked being around us. And then, in fact, um, we were introduced to him by the man who hired me way back when. He said, you've got to meet this guy. I'm going to set up a meeting. I'm going to bring him over so that you can meet this guy. And that began a, a relationship that lasted years and years and years. And he would make excuses to come to Spokane. Oftentimes he would have speaking engagements through his ministry at churches or at, uh, at schools, uh, summer camps, sometimes on his way through to somewhere else. 
Seattle or on his way back. He would come, he would get a hotel room, and he would just come and hang out every day. One time he came to me, <clears throat> we're out here, he came to me and he said, do you know what your son did? And I thought, well, <clears throat> I've got 12 of them. Uh, I, I'm not even sure I want to know. He said, that coal. Coal is about Bubba's age. He pulled out his wallet and he opened it up and he pulled out a dollar bill. He said, your son gave me this dollar bill for my ministry. He said, I'm never going to spend that dollar. It's the widow's might. I know what it cost him. And because I was his dad, and I was the one who handed out chores, I knew exactly what it cost him. He had to earn that dollar the hard way. And then he had to squirrel it away, hiding it somewhere from his other brothers and sisters who might want to find it and relieve him of it. But he was so incredibly impressed with the character of my son who was eight or ten years old, and he was right. He was right. We were, we were accused, my wife and I. Been a lot of years ago now. It's great to have that in the rear view mirror. But we were attacked and we were accused of not raising our sons and our daughters according to what the state thought we should. And so, we got visits from CPS. And they did not fight fair. We were accused. We had to be, we were hauled into court to defend ourselves. We faced charges of not only jail time, but fines. And it was a very trying time. The enemy was on the loose. They were threatening to split up our family. You are the wrong kind of people to be raising kids. We're going to take them from you. It was in, it was in some of the darkest time. We were wrestling with that. I was driving. I was by myself. My phone rang. Really been just troubled by what the possibility was, the destruction of our family, and uh, to say nothing of the, what we faced as a couple. I looked down, Ranger Horton. I remember exactly where it was, where I was driving, because I almost pulled over. I answered the phone. And he said, Warrior, what, tell me what's happening. Because he knew. We had shared with him the attacks that we were under. I said, it, it, It's coming in hot and heavy, Gary. We need some big guns. He said, I've been praying, warrior. I know. He said, you know what the truth is. You have that belt of truth. You have all of the armor. He said, stand firm. Wow. It was the right message at the right time from the right person. And God knew. God knew that in the anguish of my heart and my mind, 
who to send. And he sent Ranger Horton. I had, I had really tears of relief as he, uh, as he continued to encourage me because I knew he was right. And I, I just needed to be reminded. Ranger Horton is gone now, <clears throat> and he's gone on to his great reward. And I'm really glad because he suffered a lot in the end. His last years were, were not very good. But he would, we would talk over the phone, and at the end of every phone conversation, he would say this. He would say, Warrior, I pray for you, and your wife, and your family every night. Wow, that's convicting. He said, every one of your kids whose names I can remember, I name them by name. That's really convicting. <clears throat> as, uh, as our pastor talked about a little bit last week, Gary Horton uh, leaves a widow. She's not in good health. They only had one child, a daughter. Tammy Jo has worked for Gary's organization, American Freedom Assembly, for 19 years. She's never had another job. Now with Gary gone home, she has no means of support. She herself is a widow. Eleven months ago, her husband died. Ten years ago, her only child was killed in a tragic accident. So she has no, no sons, no daughters now to care for her and her mom. To say that they are on a shoestring and it's tight, that doesn't really do it justice. Now, God will never leave them, nor forsake them. I know that. However, I would like, even though many of you didn't know him, we have shared a little bit about his influence on our life. We would like to send a message to Ruthie and TJ that hopefully would be in an encouragement and bring some hope and bring some peace. I, I've already talked to the deacons of this church. As you know, we tithe as a church on 10% of the tithes that we receive. We tithe on that money. We do it on a quarterly basis. And our next quarterly tithe is going to go to Gary's widow and daughter. Going to go to the foundation, which is still open. They haven't closed it down yet. I want to take a special offering. We're going to make a contribution. Others of you might want to do the same. There's a green bowl on that table back there by the coat rack. If you didn't come this morning prepared, I'm going to leave it open. I'm going to leave it there through next Sunday. I would like for us to put together a nice financial gift and send to them so that they can be encouraged at this time of grief in their life. Let's close. And in closing, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to be here and to be free in Christ and to come together in that freedom to celebrate and to worship together and how important that is. And Father, we see the attacks that are arrayed against that. They've already been tried. Open our eyes. Gird us with your strength. Help us not to try and do things in our own strength, but in your power and might, 
knowing that you have the victory. And that is such a comfort. And we say, come Lord Jesus, come soon for the ultimate victory over the evil that surrounds us. Until then, strengthen us and help us when those attacks come to stand firm. In the name of our Savior, amen.